This video will guide you through visiting Carlsbad Caverns National Park in New Mexico. We'll go through a little bit of the logistics on getting there or driving around there, especially if you have an RV. Then we'll go through and show lots of video and photos on visiting the park and things that we recommend in terms of hikes and stuff to do. And then we'll end by talking about some of your camping RV lodging options. This is a map of New Mexico, and you can see up off of I-25 is where you have Santa Fe and Albuquerque. That's pretty much where 25 intersects with Highway 40. And Carlsbad is down in the southeastern part of the state. So if you're heading down I-25, you can come down this way, or if you're coming up from Texas or something, you'd be coming up on the 10. And you can take this 285, Highway 285, it actually goes all the way down into Texas and it goes all the way up to Wyoming, actually. Um, you can take that all the way. It's big rig friendly. It's totally fine. Uh, we actually came down, uh, we were coming from Santa Fe, Albuquerque area and came down and did the three park loop. So let me show you what that is. So you have White Sands National, actually it's National Park. This is a very old map outside of Alamogordo here. You have Carlsbad Caverns National Park over here, and then you have Guadalupe Mountains National Park in Texas that is right on this part. So it's easy enough to do this little loop. You could easily do that in a week, I would say. Um, might be nice to spread a little bit more time. We had a little bit more than a week between all of those parks, but you could do it in a week. And then in terms of driving this, you can go straight from Alamogordo over to Artesia and then come down to Carlsbad. You do have to go through Cloudcraft though, and this is a pretty steep elevation change. So if you're in a big rig like us and you don't necessarily love the mountain passes that have like uh, runaway truck ramps and all that kind of stuff, which they do have right around here, you may want to bypass that and take the northern route, which is what we did. We came up here on the northern route and stopped in Roswell because we wanted to check out the UFO museum and then worked our way down here. And I think it only added a little less than an hour on the driving time that we would have had. We stayed in Carlsbad and I'll show you more about lodging at the end of this. There isn't a campground that is right outside of the park. So there's not really any lodging right here. There also is very limited RV parking, especially for a big rig like us with towing. So you may wanna just plan to stay in the Carlsbad area and then do a day trip to come out and check out the actual park. And let me show you a little bit more about the map of the park. I think it's hilarious that there's this huge park guide, tons of information about bats, but the only park that's an actual map is this tiny little section right here. And that's because there really isn't anything that's all that confusing. So as you're heading north on this highway, uh, 62 I guess it's called or 180 I'm not sure you head up to Carlsbad so you're coming down this way and there's literally just one road and you take this little road and it brings you up to the visitor center and then I will show you on the video we did this Walnut Canyon Desert Drive this is a one-way dirt road this is not the kind of thing you take your RV on so this little paved section just from the highway up to the visitor center is the only thing that's going to be RV friendly. Um, there is another little section that's over here if you want to take this up into this Slaughter Canyon. We did not do this section so I will not be able to show you this but I will show you a bunch on the Visitor Center, the Walnut Canyon Drive, and a few other fun features. So let's get right to the video. So here's the most important thing I'm going to tell you in this video and that is that you need to make sure that you have booked your tickets to enter Carlsbad cavern before you come to the park so i'm not just talking about like your entrance fee your your parks pass and stuff to get into the park but the actual ticket that you need to go and enter into the cave because of covid they have not opened up the ranger led tours they still haven't at the time that i'm recording this in march of 2022 but you can do your own self-guided tour through the natural entrance. And that's what you're seeing us hike down into right here. The natural entrance is not anything for the faint of heart. It's a little over a mile in total and you have some options. You can take an elevator from the visitor center that just goes straight down into the big room 
of the cave, or you can do what we're doing right here, which is take the natural entrance down, which is nice to take it on the down part, and then take the elevator back up. And so going down, it's a lot easier, but it is pretty steep, so just be cautious of that. What's really cool is once you are down there, it is the largest cave system. Well, it's not the longest cave system, but it is the largest open space cave area that we have of any of the national parks so it's just magnificent to see how large this space is especially when you get down to the big room underneath many interpretive signs are along the way as well so even though you don't have a ranger there there's plenty of information and places where you can stop catch your breath and learn a little bit about the caves your self-guided tour tickets need to be purchased ahead of time online at recreation.gov you can go there and choose the day that you want to go, how many tour tickets you need for a child or adult. It's a dollar for anyone. That's pretty much just the reservation fee that they charge to do it. And they tend to have a lot of tickets, so there seems to be a lot of availability, but I wouldn't wait until like the day or two before your trip because they could sell out, uh, especially because they sometimes are limiting the availability based on COVID levels and whatnot. And then even though you book online, you do head to the visitor center first, you show your proof that you have your tour tickets and they give you kind of a pass that you can go and meet in front of the cave. A ranger will give you a little bit of discussion about uh, different things like you can't have food and stuff in there and then you can do the cave tour. And then here you can see we are waiting for the elevator to come down the, I don't know, 790 feet or something. I don't know, it's going to go all the way to the top. It'll show as it climbs its way down all the feet that it needs to climb into the caverns and then it'll take you back up into the visitor center on your way out. So definitely check out a cave tour. Be sure you book ahead of time. That'll be the highlight of the trip. We then had some time to kill before seeing bat flight. So we decided to do the Walnut Canyon Desert Drive. And this is about a 10 mile drive. It is a dirt road, but it's really nicely paved. It's something that any vehicle could do, not an RV vehicle, but any of your passenger vehicles, cars and stuff. You don't need any special souped up Jeep or anything like that to do it. You can just use your regular vehicle. Um, be sure you have enough water, be sure you have some food and provisions and stuff. We only saw one other vehicle on this road. And if you did have a problem with your vehicle, it'd be a little bit of a hike to get back up to the visitor center. So just be sure you are prepared as you head out on it. I don't remember having any cell service in this area either. I don't think we actually had any cell service at the entire park because you are pretty remote and out there. So this is what that drive looks like. It actually is pretty flat in the initial part, and then you get to this little look off for the Rattlesnake Canyon. And you can hike down into that canyon if you want, but of course this is Rattlesnake Country, and we decided that we didn't want to test that. As you get down there, there's like a little bit of a springs and some wetness and a little cooler, so you're probably likely to see some snakes. We did, though, see a tarantula as we were heading out of the loop, so be sure that you are going slow. The speed limit is pretty slow slow and you want to make sure that you're doing that so if you have any snakes or little critters like tarantulas you're giving them plenty of space and an opportunity to cross so we got to look at this little guy check him out from a distance but it was nice knowing that we could see him on the road and stop and let him cross before continuing on And then the last thing we did to finish up our time at Carlsbad Caverns was to do the bat flight. So this happens at the end of the day. People start kind of collecting here probably a half hour before it starts getting dark, maybe even an hour before then. And what will happen is you are not allowed to take any pictures or uh, any video, any photography, anything like that. You can see a little bit that the bats are starting to kind of circle around. You're seeing some motion because the bats are in there during the day and then when it turns dark they just kind of start all coming out and there are hundreds of thousands of these bats that are coming out of the caves and they swirl together and they head out together and head south and start going and uh, getting their dinner and stuff um, you can see the rangers getting ready so the ranger is going to present to us we're sitting here at the amphitheater preparing to hear about the bats and everything. And then once it gets dark enough, he's quiet and he allows us to just kind of watch the bats in flight. 
This photo, by the way, is from the NPS site. I did not take this because I paid attention to the rules and I had my phone turned off. You do need to know though that the bats head to Mexico for the winter. So somewhere around mid to end of October, we were here, I think October 17th-ish, and we still got to see it, but they said any day now, the bats were going to be heading south for the winter. And then they don't return until I think about mid-February. So if you are heading here in the winter months, you're not going to see them. But if you're here during the other times of year, be sure to check it out. I briefly wanted to talk about fur babies. So Carlsbad National Park is a lot like the other NPS sites and it is not dog friendly. So you are not allowed to have your dogs anywhere in there or on the trails or any or in the caves or anything like that. You can't even legally leave them in the car because it gets so hot, you will kill them. So in order to account for that and the fact that people are visiting, they do have kennels that are available there at the visitor center. It's $10 for the day and you can have them in the kennel, they give them water, and it keeps them air conditioned and cool so you can enjoy what you want to explore and do, and they can stay there. The other option, of course, that we always do is to have them at our RV, which is plugged in with power at a campground that um, they can stay hooked up to. If you are looking for an RV park with hookups, we did stay at the Carlsbad KOA and that was a fine experience. They have some nice amenities there and it was close enough to the park, probably about a half hour away. So we have a full review just on that park if you wanna check that out. And there is some BLM land around the park too. You can check out on Campendium to see more information about those locations where you can stay for free. But of course you won't have any electrical hookup. Overall, I hope this video was helpful for you in planning your trip to Carlsbad Caverns National Park. If it was useful to you, please give it a thumbs up or you can leave me a comment. We always are happy to answer questions that you have. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at RV Homeschool. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you at the parks.